If you love liberty, declare your independence by signing the Shire Society Declaration at ShireSociety.com. Thank you all for coming. Uh, this is a presentation by Bitcoin Embassy New Hampshire to look at Bitcoin Cash. Two years ago, in 2017, Bitcoin Cash popped into existence. So what was going on at that point in the history of crypto? What led to Bitcoin Cash? And what has it done? And what does it have going for? What are some of the challenges it faces? This is not meant for me to sit up here and talk the whole time. I hope this can be interactive and we can uh, talk about it and talk about what the future may bring. So, Bitcoin Cash. There was once upon a time, there was just Bitcoin. That used to be the only thing anybody had. Uh, in terms of crypto. I'm going to pop open a, a page here. Hopefully it'll pop open. Um, but just shows you how many forks have come off of Bitcoin uh, going back to its inception in, in 2009, January 3rd, when the first block was mined. A lot of people don't remember this, but there was a Bitcoin XT and a Bitcoin Unlimited. Bitcoin Classic, these were all alternatives to the original uh, code. The idea was to come up with a way to scale Bitcoin to handle more transactions. A lot of people realized early on that the way Bitcoin was built, scaling at some point, if nothing changed, was going to be a problem. So the idea of making bigger blocks really divided the crypto world. There were those who favored trying to come up with technological solutions that would allow more transactions. And then there were users who, or, and people who felt that it's very simple, and even Satoshi Nakamoto talked about it. If you needed to scale Bitcoin faster, if you needed it to handle more transactions, you could simply increase the block size. So this really kind of broke down into a couple camps. Uh, the folks who liked the idea of bigger blocks, um, Bitcoin XT was the first one. Um, that was led by Gavin Andressen and by Mike Hearn, I believe. Um, it was some new code that <coughs> could run uh, on the Bitcoin blockchain with a bigger block size. And when they put this out, it was an alternative client for Bitcoin. Uh, it never gained majority. Um, the majority of people running uh, Bitcoin software didn't change from the Bitcoin core software over to Bitcoin XT or Bitcoin Unlimited or Bitcoin Classic. But their early attempts to implement this as a solution to solve Bitcoin scaling issues. Um, when we got into, and I, I should point out there too, there were a number of other, uh, let me flip back over here, there were a number of other forks of Bitcoin. Uh, this by no means was the only one. Um, let me find my tab. Uh, in addition to these forks that were all still versions of Bitcoin, uh, Bitcoin itself began to fork, and there were option other uh, alternative currencies or, or altcoins that came off of Bitcoin. Um, not just these. Uh, you have uh, Russell Coin, you have Peercoin, you have Dash, uh, which has roots in the Bitcoin um, code base. There were lots of things that have split off of Bitcoin over the years and some of them have been successful. Um, so we have this issue of if Bitcoin is going to be a contender to other forms of money, do we do it with big blocks, do we do it with small blocks? And this was debated for years. Um, I don't know when the first debates about block size came up, but I know the first emails that Satoshi ever mentioned scaling and block size, it was his second email 
that he ever released to the world. <coughs> the second one that was ever public and available talked about scaling Bitcoin and how we could do it by increasing the block size. Which brings us to kind of the 2017 time frame. So this had been going on and there was a lot of contention between the two camps. The big blockers on one side, the small blockers on the other. And Barry Silver, who's the head of Digital Coin Group, thought that he could broker a deal. And Digital Coin Group uh, owns lots of properties, um, in addition to actual crypto mining ventures and exchanges he's got money in and things like that. He also uh, was one of those who was big in Bitcoin press. Uh, Cointelegraph was a DCG property. Um, so basically, Barry tried to broker an agreement called the New York Agreement. Uh, some people call it the Silbert Agreement. Some people call it the DCG Agreement. It was basically a number of people within the industry getting together in New York and coming up with a plan. Was this um, the Segwit 2X or is that a different Segwit? The, the original Segwit 2X. Oh. Yes, the, the original New York Agreement uh, was an, an agreement to implement segregated witness for Bitcoin. Now, what is segregated witness? Segregated witness is a soft, uh, it's an upgrade to the Bitcoin code. What it allows, it didn't require a hard fork or anything like that. You could do it just by upgrading the software. It would be backwards compatible with the old versions. Um, <coughs> What SegWit allowed were two different things. It handled witness data differently. It handled the signatures that make up part of a Bitcoin block differently. So inside every Bitcoin block that gets put together to be mined, there's a lot of signature information. A signature from the sender, a signature from the receiver, on every Bitcoin transaction that ever occurs. What SegWit does is condenses that. It makes it smaller in size. So the theory was, the theory is, I should say, that by implementing SegWit, you can come up with a effective <coughs> reduction in the size of a block. The general number that gets tossed around is if you implemented SegWit, this was back then and it holds true now, you've effectively doubled the size of a block. So Bitcoin itself has a one megabyte block size limit. By implementing SegWit, they effectively increase the block size from what used to be one megabit to the equivalent of two megabit, two megabytes. So that was the purpose behind SegWit. The small blockers were okay with this because there are other things you could do with segregated witness. Segregated witness allowed you to do side chains, chains that sat on top of the Bitcoin blockchain or alongside it. It allowed you to do more interesting things that they wanted to do. So segregated witness gave you uh, side chains like the Lightning Network that allowed for expansion in different ways doing that. It also gave you this um, kind of a virtual reduction in block size, if you will. What used to, number of transactions that would fill up one block uh, now would fill up half a block. Um, a block would now contain twice as many transactions as it used to. The second part of this agreement, because the New York agreement was designed to meet some of the, the needs or, or wants of big blockers and the small blockers. The second part of this was to agree to increase the block size to two megabytes for block or for Bitcoin. So the first thing was supposed to happen, we'd implement segregated witness and then later on um, there would be an implementation of a hard fork. Do you guys know what the difference between a soft fork is and a hard fork? 
real quickly, um, a soft fork, if I make a change to my software, and let's say I added some new features, but you could still run the old version. Let's say we're talking about Microsoft Word. Uh, Word 20, 2020 comes out, and it is completely compatible with Microsoft Word 2016 or 2013. It's backwards compatible. I don't have to upgrade. There's some reasons I might want to upgrade, but I don't have to. That's a soft word. If Microsoft Word 2020 came out and suddenly it was not compatible with any previous version of Microsoft Word, if you want to keep using Microsoft Word, you've got to upgrade by this date or your stuff you're doing, it's not going to be able to be read by anybody else who upgraded. That's a hard fork. So the resolution was to agree to increase this block size to two megabytes through a hard fork. That would have required everyone to upgrade their Bitcoin client from the old stuff to the new stuff. You gotta go there. Not long after this agreement came out, and I remember having this conversation with Ian. You know, we were talking about, you know, Consensus 2017. That's where this meeting took place in New York. And uh, I remember just sitting there, and I think we were in agreement. What's going on? You've got a bunch of CEOs of mining ventures and of Bitcoin companies saying this is the way we're all going to go. I remember uh, you at one point said, well, I guess that's the way we're going to go. Because <laughs> it didn't seem like anything was going to change without this happening. And it was just a foregone conclusion. Uh, the group of people that signed this agreement, uh, it was touted, represented something like 85 or 95 percent of the mining power in Bitcoin. Well, man, if all the miners are going that direction, I guess everybody else is going along that way too. The reality turned out to be a little different. There were a lot of people that weren't happy with being told by a bunch of CEOs in a conference room in New York, this is what you guys are going to do. People are going, wait, wait, wait. You guys have been telling us how anybody can get involved in the Bitcoin network. You can run your own node. You can you can be as big a part of it as anybody else. You can vote by choosing the version of software you're going to run, and that was um, you know promised by both sides. Uh, everybody agreed on that point. That's what it was supposed to be. But suddenly we took this different turn, this turn that said, "No, we've decided for you. You got to get on board with." A lot of people didn't like that. So 2017 was a was a crazy year. You had people that were very opposed to the idea of being told they have to do something, but they liked part of the agreement. Uh, the small blockers were all like, absolutely, let's do segregated witness for Bitcoin. That's perfect, we'll do that part of it. Um, you had big blockers that said, man, we got to get this two megabyte. It's a start. It's not where you need to go. Um, but you know, even though we've got to accept segregated witness, we do that for two megabyte uh, block size. Neither side was in. Neither side was really. It was a compromise. Nuts. It was a compromise. As a result, um, different groups came out against different aspects of it. One of the most well-known groups, I don't know who started it, um, but it was this uh, thing called No2X. It was people that were opposed to the idea of creating the block size, and there was a plan to kind of to make to force people's hands, because not everyone had signaled that they were willing to follow this path. Um, Bit 148 forced people's hands. It said, look, uh, you're either going to sign on or we're going to do a user-activated soft fork 
uh, which will pretty much make it a requirement that it, your customers aren't going to be compatible with you. Um, it was a protest, but it really did shake out where people stood. In the end, this whole debate and this whole New York agreement never really went through. We got segregated witness, that happened, but the support for the hard fork to go to two megabytes faltered. Um, Digital Coin Group, like I said, they were the ones behind all this. DCG did an analysis uh, as this date was approaching in Cointelegraph. And they looked at how many companies were actually truly committed to doing this. They originally talked about 95 companies with you know, 95 or 95 or 95% of all the mining power. When they took out the companies that were owned by DCG, they just assumed they would go along. They took out the ones who had changed their mind um, for whatever reason or come out and said something different. It actually came down to about 15 or 16 companies that actually intended to go along with it. That kind of killed the New York agreement. Now, while this is all going on, this guy named Omri, Frenchman, had been working on his own Bitcoin client. <coughs> He called it Bitcoin ABC. When it became apparent that the main Bitcoin blockchain was not likely to see a hard fork that would take it to 2 megabyte block size limit, um, kind of ramped up some thought in certain groups that maybe we ought to get behind this code that Omri has been developing. And I remember um, Roger Beer was on Free Talk Live right around this time. Um, and I happened to be on the show that night. And, you know, what's going to happen? Roger said, there's going to be a split. I don't know how many Bitcoins are going to come out of this. Uh, he was saying it could be two, three, four, could be more. But there was only really one support for one that survived all this turmoil, and that was Bitcoin Cash. Bitcoin Cash. cash. <laughs> 20 years off. I guess I did get a tape over there. Uh, August 1st, 2017, the chain split. Bitcoin Cash came into existence. A couple things about how that happened. Um, they did implement replay protection. They did try to implement wipeout protection. What that means is that when a chain splits, and I can't remember, I just, 455889, I think, was the block number when it happened. Because they said when this block hits, then it's going to split. When those blocks split, there are suddenly two chains. The rules of Bitcoin would say that the longest chain, the one with the most transactions, would be the true Bitcoin blockchain. Um, it also says that the way it was set up was that if you have coins on one chain, this was part of the replay protection and the wipeout protection, you will simultaneously receive coins on the other chain. That was kind of, I don't know if it was now because uh, Ethereum did an airdrop. Uh, it was a grant. Uh, basically everybody who owned a Bitcoin now also owned a Bitcoin cash. If you had 10,000 Bitcoin, you owned 10,000 Bitcoin cash. Uh, so it made a lot of people kind of happy. Uh, it wasn't an, it wasn't saying we you're going to receive the equivalent value it's going to depend on how the market prices bitcoin cash um, you will have double the double the coins that you had before so that's kind of where what got us here um, i've got to say i went through the bitcoin cash split um, we were 
talking a lot about what's it, what's going to happen. I remember we turned off access to our uh, Bitcoin vending machine for a couple days. Uh, nobody really knew how this was going to play out. Is everything going to blow up? Is, is this thing going to be really uh, bad? But it was really implemented pretty well. And it was basically within a day, everybody realized that the world's not falling. Uh, it's going to happen, and, and we're going to deal with it. There was some question when it first occurred because the original Bitcoin Cash was going to use the same addressing scheme as Bitcoin. I think everybody quickly realized that causes some confusion. If a Bitcoin Cash address starts with a one, just like a Bitcoin address does, then people have to be careful when they send Bitcoin. As a result, a lot of people were sending Bitcoin to a Bitcoin. They thought they were sending it to a, another, uh, or sending it to a Bitcoin, sending Bitcoin Cash to a Bitcoin Cash address that was actually a Bitcoin address, or vice versa. And that was how you could have lost some coins when that happened. Um, but I think everybody kind of figured out what was going on, and everybody had tried to educate everybody and, and resolve um, most of those things from happening. Um, the, the doomsayers thought that this would just be the end of Bitcoin, Bitcoin Cash, because nobody will ever be able to tell where transactions end up. That turned out to be a non-issue. <coughs> Any questions so far? The 1997 date was wrong. Yes. <laughs> 2017. I'm 20 years off. This Close. Yeah. It would, two tickets. it really wouldn't have predated uh, Bitcoin by so long. So we're going to talk a little bit about Bitcoin Cash advantages. And I really had a hard time coming up with a title for this slide because it's a matter of perspective. If these are what uh, most Bitcoin Cash supporters see as their advantages. That doesn't mean everybody in the world sees them as advantages. They might see them as points of contention or controversial. But Bitcoin Cash certainly has larger block sizes. This was the goal, the, the first thing that, that started this whole thing was make bigger blocks. When Bitcoin Cash rolled out when the chain split, it immediately implemented eight megabyte blocks. That was eight times the size of Bitcoin blocks. There you have your big block solution. It's there. Uh, another thing Bitcoin Cash has done, the Bitcoin has not done, is implement zero confirmations for fast transactions. <clears throat> so basically what this means is... Now what does that actually mean? Zero confirmations. Zero confirmations means that a transaction can be tagged to go through before any Bitcoin miner has confirmed the block. It's been checked by a node to verify that the transaction follows the Bitcoin Cash rules, but it has not been added to a block. In most cryptocurrencies, that would mean that funds are not available. You, you can't have them, you can't spend them until we have at least one confirmation or five confirmations or six confirmations depending on the cryptocurrency. We're not gonna allow you to spend firmed funds that are unconfirmed by being added to a block. Bitcoin Cash allows this. Now, they don't just say, we don't confirm blocks anymore. Bitcoin Cash still functions just like Bitcoin does in terms of how the mining process works and things getting confirmed and added to a block. But you can choose to accept a payment uh, even though it's unconfirmed. So it kind of puts the, the power in the person receiving's hands. Uh, am I willing to accept the risk that the person who's supposed to send me money could decide to roll that back 
And it's not that simple. You roll can't just down. roll back a transaction. You would have to remine the block and basically create a new blockchain. Uh, it opens up the possibility that someone could attack the Bitcoin blockchain, Bitcoin Cash blockchain, and double spend. That's the issue. <coughs> that's why it's controversial. But there is no controversy as to what it does for the user's experience. They get a fast, immediate transaction. That's kind of cool. A lot of people feel that the opportunity for somebody to game a transaction through a double spend uh, isn't worth it. That'll be the, the challenge from traditional Bitcoin um, people to the idea of zero confirmation. But there's no doubt that it is popular. A lot of transactions are done at zero confirmation. The other thing Bitcoin Cash has done that I think is really innovative is they did simple ledger protocol. And that is a protocol that sits within the blockchain. It's part of Bitcoin Cash. There is not a side chain or anything like that. Bitcoin Cash didn't implement SegWit, so they do everything on chain. But it allows anyone to quickly, easily, and cheaply create a token. Create their own token on the Bitcoin blockchain. Now, this has always been done in the crypto world, mostly with Ethereum. Ethereum has this uh, type of smart contract called an ERC token, or ERC20 tokens. Um, that is what almost every ICO a couple years ago was built with. It's an ERC20 token. Bitcoin Cash, because Bitcoin has always had this logic, it's always had the capability of supporting smart contracts. Ethereum just took that idea and said, we're going to try to make them really smart and give you more programming tools. But that has always been part of Bitcoin, and it became part of Bitcoin Cash. So Bitcoin Cash actually sort of caused a little renaissance in the idea of putting tokens on blockchains, and they enabled that on the chain itself. So anyone can come up with their own cryptocurrency, come up with their own security token, utility token, uh, release as many or as few as you ever wanted to do. Um, that can be done today. And I know uh, you guys have created tokens. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I did one just, just for the heck of it. It was remarkably simple. There are other tokens out there that allow the same thing. Ravencoin uh, is kind of built around that whole concept of, of doing these. Um, but hey, you're, you're going to burn 500 Raven if you want to do one. Uh, Bitcoin Cash, it was virtually free. So that's another advantage I see. What do you guys see as some other advantages to Bitcoin Cash? Fast, cheap? Yes, faster and cheaper. Fast tokens, that's, I don't know of anything. Else. Yeah. So let's talk about fees. Bitcoin Cash barely even has a detectable fee. <clears throat> What's the difference between that and Bitcoin? Why are Bitcoin, Bitcoin traditional ones have been 37 bucks. How does Bitcoin Cash do that for free? So there are, what developed in the Bitcoin world was this fee marketplace. If you want your transactions to go through really fast, uh, slip me a couple bucks and I'll make sure your transaction is in the next block. Um, that's, that's basically what fees are. Bitcoin Cash, um, and I may be wrong on this, so put a caveat on this, uh, they have fixed the fee uh, to be a Satoshi per kilobyte. That's all it is, all it ever will be. So that I is... Fixed, fixed it. I believe it's written into the code. I don't mean that to sound like it's price fix. I mean it's part of the current Bitcoin... Um, yeah. 
uh, it has a very, very I low fee. It could increase if the blocks got full. Oh, they could. But I'm saying on today's version of software, as I understand it, uh, Bitcoin, uh, Bitcoin Cash um, fee is set. Now that's that could be done in Bitcoin too. We could say, you know, Bitcoin's fees are now this. If you had enough people that supported that idea, that it could be implemented. That's the thing about Bitcoin and Bitcoin Cash. It's it's all about proposing an idea, convincing enough people that it's a worthwhile idea, and then it gets implemented into the code. If people don't implement your change, then it doesn't become part of the code. That's how it works. Um, so that sort of definitely provided a, a big, I think, a big advantage to Bitcoin Cash and it was done at an opportune time because Bitcoin, regular Bitcoin transaction fees were going through the roof. Um, so Bitcoin Cash certainly has that over Bitcoin. Uh, the low fees are huge. Um, whether fee or whether transactions are actually faster, um, I think that can can still be debated. If, if if you were to go apples to apples, um, well, you can't go apples to apples because we've got an apple over here and we've got a, uh, an orange over here. Um, They're both orange. slow. They they are. Because um, the blocks come slow sometimes on both, this on both sides. Zero confirmation does give the appearance that things are moving quicker. And it does. You know, you, you see it fast, it's there, and people who are not uh, worried about protection for double spend uh, can say that my, I got my transaction right away. If you send me money and it was zero confirmation, as soon as it showed up on the blockchain and my phone recognized it, your wallet recognized it, boom, I got my money. Does that mean that you can spend it right away? Yes. Um, so yeah, for some transactions, that's here's where I stand on zero comp. Um, if I were sending a hundred million dollars um, to another country to somebody I didn't know, I would not want that to be a zero confirmation transaction. I want a couple people to take a look at it first and say, "Yeah, yep, I like that one, and it's been mined, and people have looked at the block and said, yep, that's valid." A couple. A couple miners have looked at it, and now it's part of the blockchain. That's a concern. I, I want that. That's the security that Bitcoin's blockchain allows. Um, so is zero conf just allowing the client to peek into the mempool and see what's coming up, or does it actually change something on the blockchain? Well, it's actually seeing something hit the blockchain. Yeah. Um, do I care if a zero comp allows me, I don't really care if it's, it allows me to buy a soda really quick at Corner News. That to me is a perfect use case for zero confirmation. The risk is, you know, Roberta may lose about uh, 75 cents if somebody went through all the trouble of, you know, hacking this transaction to get a free soda. The risk is very low for that kind of a transaction. So maybe zero comp has a, a good role there. Um, I just don't. I don't personally agree that it should be. Um, it shouldn't be the expectation expectation for every transaction. But Bitcoin Cash could definitely do it. And that's really a decision you make on client side. I believe so. It's just. You look at the thing and you say, well, I, I see the transaction, but there's no confirmation, so why don't you stick around for a while? As it's been explained to me, you can you can choose a zero conf, a zero confirmation transaction. So yeah. Um, so what are some challenges of Bitcoin Cash? <coughs> I think there are a couple. Um, the adoption question has always been a concern. Bitcoin Cash um, 
could really have taken off if it gained massively in adoption if more people were using Bitcoin Cash than were using Bitcoin. If more people were using um, Bitcoin Cash than Dash or, or Litecoin or anything like that. If they can truly achieve massive adoption, and it is not for lack of trying. You've got a lot of people, a lot of them with a lot of money that are very committed to the project. And you've got developers that are very, very committed to the project. If that leads to more people using Bitcoin Cash, uh, Bitcoin Cash will stay, stick around. That's how it is. The second aspect that Bitcoin Cash has to do is, I think, they need to increase the amount of hashing power on their chain. So Bitcoin Cash started off using SHA-256 uh, algorithms for mining blockchain. Um, that hashing power with the same algorithm can be used to mine Bitcoin Cash or it can be used to mine Bitcoin. If more hashing power doesn't move over to the Bitcoin Cash side, you'll be left with a less secure blockchain. I think this is an ongoing challenge of Bitcoin Cash. Um, now, um, Blockstream, a major Bitcoin player company, uh, just announced that they had built a massive mining facility, uh, two massive mining facilities, um, that have somewhere around 10 exabytes, excuse me, exahashes of capacity to be used in, in mining. That means that Blockstream by themselves could fully attack the Bitcoin Cash block chain while completely attacking the Bitcoin SV blockchain just with the power that they have in their two data centers. There's more power in those two data centers than there is hashing power for Bitcoin Cash than there is for Bitcoin SV. That's a whole lot of hashing power, and that would make Bitcoin Cash vulnerable to a 51% attack. If I can 51% attack, I can take the Bitcoin Cash blockchain any direction I want. I can rewrite it. I can change transactions and then approve those transactions. I can pull off a massive attack on Bitcoin Cash. So. Bitcoin Cash having somewhere around two exahashes of hashing power right now, I would say puts it in a little bit vulnerable position. Um, Bitcoin, on the other hand, has uh, somewhere around somewhere 60 or 80-ish uh, exahashes versus two. So Bitcoin Cash, uh, I think, needs to get some hashing power, convince more people. Um, that they should be mining Bitcoin Cash. Um, right now, Bitcoin Cash is marginally more profitable to mine than Bitcoin. Um, but that number is always moving. Uh, I think they need some, some dedicated people that will stick it out for Bitcoin Cash. Uh, the other thing is just competition. Bitcoin Cash, when Bitcoin Cash first came about, this was the culmination of this awfully long and somewhat bloody battle over big blocks versus small blocks. Um, I don't know that the market has, has completely sided with Bitcoin Cash on that. A lot of people have, but a lot of people haven't. You still have coins out there that still have a lot of transactions. Uh, Litecoin still has a lot of transactions. Uh, Dash um, has done a real good job of getting more people on board with it. Um, those are, you know, top ten coins. Um, what's going to separate 
Bitcoin Cash from the competition. What can they do or what will they do? Uh, will they lay out a roadmap that, that offers something extremely compelling? Uh, I think that is, is really what it comes down to. Bitcoin, there's, there's 1,500 competitors to Bitcoin. There's 1,500 competitors to Bitcoin Cash. Um, will they survive the competition? Any thoughts? Any questions? Overall, <coughs> I've got to be optimistic. I, I've seen what adoption looks like. We see it in Keene, New Hampshire every day. You can go into almost every single place that accepts cryptocurrency, and almost every one of them <coughs> accepts Bitcoin Cash. I thought um, at the Fork Fest. Fest this year, I talked to a few different vendors afterwards and asked how were people paying, and they said Bitcoin Cash was the big one. And uh, you know that seemed to be, you know, we couldn't just appropriate that to Keen because there were people from all over the place that were were vending there and they were taking Bitcoin Cash. So that seemed to be a, a good endorsement for it. I mean, it, it knocked even Dash out of the, the water. I heard uh, people talk about that a lot. Um, I, think I had one vendor refuse to take Dash from me, but they took Bitcoin Cash <laughs> for whatever reason. People do have their preferences, and you know it, it does show that if you get the name out there, if you're uh, if you have dedicated uh, people dedicated to the coin, they can make it happen. Back in the day, there were. A there were a lot of uh, uh, hardcore activists that were very interested in promoting Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really changed, uh, at least in New Hampshire, over the last year or two. Um, more people are on board with Bitcoin Cash, more people are on board with Dash. Um, they're promoting these all, uh, other coins over Bitcoin. And a lot of people just say, you know, nobody's going to want to do a transaction that's going to cost them so much in transaction fees. Or, I've also heard this a lot, um, well, as a business, I choose to choose Bitcoin Cash and Dash. I choose not to recommend to anyone that they pay me in Bitcoin because they'll be, they'll be paying a lot of money in fees and things like that, and I don't want to do that to my customers. So you have that, too. Um, it's, it's going to be interesting. Now, Bitcoin's solution to this is to use a sidechain. Um, their goal is to use the Lightning Network to have that become the easy transaction, the low-fee solution to allow for scalability. Jury's out. The, the software's out there. You can run it. If you want to buy something in our store with the Lightning Network, you can do so. Um, but it's uh, it's young. It's it's only about a year old. Uh, that's not really ready for prime time. Now, do I have to set something up with you to do lightning with you, or no? Um, the easiest way to do lightning is to use a custodial wallet. If you're only talking about a small amount, um, there's a couple custodial wallets out there. You can just send some small amount of Bitcoin to this address. Mm -hmm. So let's say I want to do $10 worth of Bitcoin available for Lightning transactions. You could then uh, pay anyone with that from that custodial wallet. That's the easiest way to try out Lightning Network. Mm -hmm. uh, and it'll work, it'll work just fine. If you want to um, do it sort of the right way to maintain custody of your Bitcoin, you can set up sort of a full wallet or um, you know, basically uh, what I would do there is open up a payment channel with anybody on the Lightning Network. You can set one up with me, I can set up a Lightning uh, payment channel. So let's say you wanted $20 to spend on the Lightning Network, 
So I say, okay, Rich, I'll, I'll take that deal. I'll set up a payment channel with you. Uh, I'll put twenty dollars in and to match your twenty dollars. And there it is. It's now a funded uh, payment channel. You can pay anybody in the world because you've got twenty bucks in a channel, up to twenty dollars. Um, it doesn't matter. Um, it doesn't have to be just with me. Lightning network payments. It's on a network, so you can pay anyone. So for the first first six months or so, I used Lightning Network. I had one payment channel I set up with a company in France. I probably did a dozen, two dozen Lightning transactions. None of them were in France. <laughs> None of them were with that company, but if it's on the Lightning Network, it goes through. The easiest way is to try and knock the studio wall up, and it makes it simple okay. and less secure. So. If you have a, a connection with a company in France and you're not doing any business in France, does that connection do anything for you or are other people's transactions going across it? Or? If you set up a payment channel, potentially yes. So, the, the didn't want this to uh, be about Lightning Network, but if my, my channel happened to be one of the fastest hops between point A and point B, people that try to go point A to point B might well go through my node. If they do, I would get a very small part of those transactions. Um, I've never seen a lightning transaction have a fee that hit a penny. Um, I'm sure you can do it, but it's just, it's just that's not really how it works. You said uh, after a year Lightning wasn't quite ready for prime time. Bitcoin Cash wasn't ready for prime time until a year in. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't have recommended it to anybody because of the address issues. Yeah. Uh, I, I wasn't going to put it on the vending machines because I didn't want any chance that a customer could screw up. Because we knew people who screwed up. Like people yeah. should have known better. Yeah. Uh, made mistakes and and sent old Bitcoin to a new Bitcoin Cash address or vice vice versa. Yeah. And so knowing the potential for error, I, you know, I said, there's no way I'm going to sell this until, uh, unless and until it gets to the point where it is ready for the average user. And I don't think it was for at least a year. Definitely. Um, but it, it didn't take, uh, I'd say the, the crypto world is a pretty fast, pretty fast at shaking things out. It was like I was surprised that, you know, within a few days after Bitcoin Cash, the big problems that those problems you speak of, though they were identified yeah. real fast, uh, and it wasn't long before, you know, there were facts online how to recover your Bitcoin if you sent it to a Bitcoin Cash address. And, and, and well, I don't want it. Otherwise. It was all pretty quick. Um, I think the same thing will happen with Lightning. Um, the motto in the Lightning Network, if there's a word that revolves around it, is reckless. Um, you want to be reckless? Pay me with Lightning Network. Uh, sort of uh, poking fun, inviting people to take a chance, you know. Uh, it could go wrong. No, you might lose your money, but hey, you get to try it out. So um, it'll be interesting to see where it goes. Um, it'll be interesting to see where Bitcoin Cash goes. Um, you know, I don't really know what's what's on the road. Um, I do know, and this is one thing I do want to talk about. Bitcoin Cash has taken a, a sort of a, a position that we're not going to upgrade. We're not going to require that we're only going to do soft forks. We're gonna, not going to require that every change we do is going to be backwards compatible. Bitcoin Cash has sort of embraced the idea of regular hard forks. I believe that's still the path they're going down. I think it's every six months. Every six months there's going to be an upgrade that requires everybody on the network to upgrade their software. Um, it's not going to be uh, compatible with, with what was there before. Um, so every six months Bitcoin Cash does a hard fork. Wasn't that one of those where uh, SV split off? Uh, those times? Yes, yes. SV came into existence after uh, after a hard fork. Um, 
it, it's a question of whether which which way do you want to go? You know, you, you got different preferences that different groups of users or, or developers uh, think is a good way to go. The Bitcoin, the Bitcoin, the, the core developers have really really opposed hard forks, making something that's not backwards compatible. As such, they've insisted that the only thing that's going to get uh, passed and become part of the next release are things that can be done in soft forks. So this was also a criticism of the Bitcoin core team. Things move too slow. You know, if you're you're going to uh, there's privacy technology out there called Mimblewimble. If you're going to wait for us to figure out how to do Mimblewimble, yet maintain backwards compatibility, it could be another three years before you see Mimblewimble on Bitcoin. Um, that's a reality. That was a, another complaint. And, and Bitcoin Cash, because they chose their own direction, is free to do it this way. Okay, we're going to do hard forks every six months. Now, is that a good idea or a bad idea? I don't know. I know they had one issue um, that did blow up. Uh, it wasn't a big deal. It, it didn't cause any loss of coin, um, but it did cause some outages um, during one of their hard forks. They were able to correct it and stuff like that, but I think the people involved in Bitcoin uh, just don't want to take that risk. They would rather it take longer, and it's been thoroughly tested, and so on and so on. So that um, did demonstrate that the hard fork can go wrong, and when it does, it affects everybody. Uh, everybody who upgraded. Uh, any other questions? I did wear my Bitcoin Cash green shirt today. Nice. Completely unintentionally. Nobody has anything else. I'd say that wraps it up. I want to thank everybody for coming. Always appreciate it. Thanks for putting that together. If you have any questions about Bitcoin Cash or Bitcoin or Lightning Network or anything like that, feel free to hit us up at BitcoinEmbassyNH.org. We'd like to invite you to visit Freekeen.com. Freekeen.com features audio, video, and blogs chronicling the transition to a voluntary society. Freekeen.com also has comments and discussion forums so you can be heard. Freekeen.com. I should be in Keene, New Hampshire with the Free Staters.